Um, we have a lot to get through, but uh, it, it's funny, I gave the same presentation in Singapore with some very slight modifications, uh, and I called it uh, uh, Why Some Studios Get Bought, um, and it was extremely popular, R room was filled, but I felt like that was a little bit of a misleading title because um, what I'm going to talk to you about is not only how to sell your studio, um, but also how to raise money uh, and how to ultimately create something of, of value. Um, so a little bit about me, I've done the big corporation thing. I was at uh, Dell and Microsoft and Disney and all those kind of things. Um, I founded quite a few companies. I've sold a, a handful of my own companies um, for substantial profits. And, uh, and then to bring it around full circle, I've now uh, been a VC for the last few years. Um, and I work with, with four uh, different uh, um, uh, venture capital firms with about $2 billion under management. I personally have led uh, rounds and transactions worth over a billion dollars. Uh, so I've, I've been around and I've kind of seen what works and what doesn't. Um, the saddest thing I've experienced, uh, whether it be my companies or even a competitor's companies, is watching a company fail. Um, there's a certain transitional phases that companies go through. First product launch, uh, repeat product launch if they've already had one success and then uh, trying to sell the company or trying to raise money. Failing at any of those things almost guarantees that the company bombs. Um, so I'm hoping I can help you at least with those last two. Selling your company or raising money actually starts the day that you found the company. If you've already founded your company, it's not too late to change. Um, but it is important for you to focus on certain key things and how it's going to look to investors. Because, because while you want to break the mold when it comes to your games, fundraising and M&A transactions have been this, roughly the same for the last hundred years. Um, there are certain things that people want to see in order to, in order to speed up a, or accelerate a transaction. So focus. You've got to decide. Is your company going to focus on tech, IP, or consumers? In other words, are you going to build a game engine that you're ultimately going to sell to other studios? Are you going to focus on IP that you're going to try and leverage throughout the industry in some sort of cross-platform or cross-market promotion? Uh, or are you just going to go after customers and just, just put out as much clickbait as you can, get as many users as you can, then ultimately sell your users? I suggest you pick one. Um, it's very hard down the road to explain to a, an investor or to an acquirer that the company has some really great IP, oh, and they have a game engine you should take a look at. Usually there's one reason that they want to acquire you. Trim the fat, just get rid of the things that don't matter. Laser focus on the thing that really matters. And ultimately, build versus buy. A lot of technologists, I'm a technologist, I love to build stuff, right? I love challenges. You gotta kinda reel it in every once in a while and you gotta make a decision whether it's better to just buy someone else's solution. Making growth part of your startup plan. So in terms of human resources, I see a lot of people talk about this idea of flat org charts. When I was in my early 20s, I loved it, right? Love and peace and hire my friends. And yeah, we were roommates once, so that qualifies you to be my chief marketing officer. Um, and it all sounds good. The problem is that doesn't scale, right? You've really got to give some thought to the individual cogs that make up this machine that you're building and then find the right person to fit into that role. Don't do it the other way around. Don't, don't hire based on potential uh, and then try and slot those people into jobs or find jobs for them. Um, that really only works when the machine's already running. Another important thing up there which comes up as you start to raise money or you go to sell your company is the employee's work product legally owned. I'll touch on this in a little bit, but I can't tell you in almost every transaction I've done with game, game companies, uh, they haven't properly secured their employees' IP. They hired their chief technology officer um, very early on, their, their, their chief engineers very early on. Those people brought some work product to the company, they used their tool sets, whatever it is. They go to sell the company and they find out that the company can't survive without that particular piece that they didn't lock down. 
So make it part of your employment contracts from day one, and that includes the founders. Paid in capital. Are founders investing in the company with money or time? And if the answer is yes, account for that. You have to know ahead of time, I gave up a $200,000 a year salary in order to start this company. Therefore, I'm worth $200,000 a year, although I'm not getting paid it right now. That's called your paid in capital. And when you go to sell the company, that was considered your investment in the company at those early stages and those early valuations. You have to keep track of those things. Otherwise, you start re reaching unrealistic numbers that, that can't be justified easily. Did the founders bring equipment or IP into the company? It's a really important thing, and does the company truly own everything? I see a lot of, a lot of uh, sales that, that people try to do, or they try to, get, they try to get investors into their company, and they say, well, you're investing in this game, but you don't have any rights to the game engine, that's mine. Well, no, it doesn't work like that, right? You, you, you can't create that type of situation. You have to agree ahead of time on what the value of your IP is. You have to put it in the company, and if the company goes bankrupt, then it all gets sold and you and the investors get paid back. And unfortunately, you lose whatever it is that you put in. So why are some studios worth so much? Well, users are the single greatest asset, and I'm gonna talk to you about why that is and how acquirers look at your users. Understanding your users actually multiplies the value of your users. If you understand what drives them, so if you have a very vocal group of people who have told you what matters about your game, and you listen to them and you've developed a relationship with them, that, uh, that user, those users, are worth a lot more money. So this is one of my favorite quotes. It's better to remain silent and be thought a fool than to open one's mouth and remove all doubt. And what that means is, Sometimes it's better, at least in my world, to raise money or to sell your company before you've launched. And that's a, that's a really hard thing to do because you won't get the valuation you think you're gonna get. You're really passionate about what's gonna happen. But I've seen a lot of times where people launch a product and they don't do the numbers that they thought they were going to do. And suddenly the company is worth less than they thought. It's always better to do a partial deal take some of their money and use that money to assure a smooth product launch. So creating a buzz, you know, I mean, this is, this, I think everybody's seen some fantastic presentations on this. Um, but I think it's really important to focus on the fact that uh, you actually start creating your, your fan base very early on. It speaks to, to knowing your fan base. Um, be careful catering to discontent, that means you know, the most vocal voices are always gonna be the most negative. Uh, so be really careful about the way that you're crafting your content. Recruit notable advisors early and use them. Again, don't just go for your friends, your roommates, your parents, things like that. You've got to look outside of the bubble and you've got to start bringing in advisors from VC firms even, even if they're not investing in you. Because when you need their Rolodex, you'll pick up the phone and you'll get it and you'll have their, their respect and their, their network of connections. So studio valuations. This is a, this is a painful subject you always come to. Um, a couple years ago, we sold uh, a uh, particular game studio to a, to a mega corporation and, and um, and unfortunately, the owner had a lot of ego invested in the company. And you start running these numbers, and this is really what your company's worth, right? If you don't have one of these X factors, which is valuable IP, either you, you can accelerate their development internally, you're going, to, uh, you're going to negate some kind of opportunity cost, they're gonna miss a spot in the market if it weren't for your technology. Um, or what would a competitor buy you for? If you don't have one of those, then what you really are is a glorified, glorified recruiter. You've put together a team, you've assembled everyone, you've trained everyone, and now they're gonna, they're gonna essentially absorb uh, your company. And that's called an aqua hire. Um, the valuations aren't great. So I would really focus when you go to raise money or when you go to sell your company on these four things. The real fascinating one is acceleration of development and opportunity costs, in my opinion. 
Um, it's pretty easy to find companies that have missed a turn and they need to make up for it and they're willing to spend their way out of it. Um, those are always gonna be the absolute best returns. All right, so why, why is somebody gonna pay you for your users? And this is an interesting model. Some companies, some investors are gonna look at your bottom line and they're gonna to try to convince you that that's what your company's worth. And that's not true. It's not true because you don't have the capability of utilizing in-network advertising that they do. You don't have the data scientists that they do. Um, you don't have the kind of cross-channel or global marketing that they do. So what they do is they take a look at, at your users and they look at their market and they say, how can we make money, you know, what's our LTV off these users? So it's too easy to get caught up in how much your company actually makes off your users when you should be focused on how much are they gonna make off your users. And again, that comes to knowing your users and such. But I would encourage you, when you enter into any type of negotiation, don't start with your balance sheet. Because being, especially being an independent developer or having just a few titles under your belt, you don't have the network and the capabilities that some of these bigger companies do. So these are some of the things that investment capital uh, groups are gonna look for and even angel investors. So what we wanna look for is how you hire, how you develop your company, how serious you are about running it like a corporation. To give you an idea, uh, Signia Adventures has invested in, well, some of the, some of the largest out there. Um, one of our most successful has been uh, Super Evil Megacorp with, with Vainglory. Um, that group started with the idea of being a billion dollar company and built it, built everything that way. And so their success was very, very easy to follow. Early on, the right investors, the right board, the right management, they went after uh, they went after scale from day one because ultimately that's a measure of your success, whether or not your company with seven, eight, nine, 10, 50 people can scale to 1,000 or 2,000 people and scale globally. Have you designed your processes internally? So when it comes to evaluating an offer, I, and this isn't a pitch, because uh, I'm kind of full up right now. But I would, I would tell you, you have to have a third party advocate. Everyone has this idea that if they build something successful, that ultimately they're, they're, someone will be pounding on their door with a, a billion dollar check. And that's really not how it works. If you've seen successful transactions in the press, you're seeing the result usually of years of discussion. Um, a third party advocate is someone that you engage very early on. They help you set up your company and arrange your company. They have connections. They go out and get advice. They soft, they soft market your company. They soft sell your company. And they're able to say things that you're not able to say. Don't over negotiate. And my personal, I don't ever negotiate by red line. If you know what that means, it's sending contracts back and forth with red lines through the things that you don't like and trying to change things that way. It's an inefficient way to negotiate. It takes all the spirit out of the negotiation. Sit down in a room or get on the phone and talk about your fears, talk about the things that upset you, talk about the things that insult you, and talk about the things that you're excited about. If there's not a match there after you have that sort of emotional discussion, you have no business moving forward. This is the games industry, right? It's, it's art, it's not science. So if there's not that, that spiritual connection between you and the people that you're gonna be working with, you probably should bag it. And despite what people think about it, uh, venture capitalists, that we're all hawks, um, I can tell you, no one wants you to fail. No one wants to beat you down. Doesn't mean they don't wanna get a good deal, but no one wants to put you in a situation where it's not in your best interest to succeed and where you're, you're not gonna make a lot of money by succeeding. So talking about uh, negotiations, these are just some things to consider. Um, when somebody's going to invest in you or somebody's going to acquire your company, 
We talk about retention. We talk about uh, uh, you know whether or not your employees ultimately are going to be retained or whether you're going to be retained uh, as you move forward with your company. You need to make sure that you're that you enter in early on to discussions with your employees so that they understand that you're going through this process, and part of the process is going to be you're going to have to compensate them to stay with the company for two years or whatever it is that's going to be required at a minimum. Holdbacks. A holdback is essentially where when somebody is going to buy you or invest in you, they're going to agree to a certain amount, but they're going to hold back a little bit of the money just, to, just in case you misrepresented something. Um, it's usually about 10 or 20% of the total sale price, and it usually has to do with patents. It's to make sure that if somebody comes along and sues based on a patent, uh, that, that you know, they've got a little bit of money to defend that lawsuit with. You can do things, by the way, like demand that you control the litigation. Um, that's a super valuable tool because a big corporation, if they've held back $5 million, they'll just pay the $5 million. So um, you want to make sure they don't do that. Earnouts, I think everybody knows you hit certain goals, you get your cash. Control of IP litigation, I just talked about that. And indemnity, you're indemnifying them against maybe a misrepresentation. So again, you want to make sure that you're locked down with what you actually own from your employees and from yourself. Not disclosing ownership of inventions. It's the number one thing I've seen kill deals. The CTO that says, hey, you're selling the company for $100 million and my, it sits on my technology, so I want 50. Um, I, I've seen it just bury deals. Um, open source licenses. Keep track of the open source licenses that you use because when somebody goes to invest, uh, or acquire you, they're going to want a list of all the different GPL licenses and new licenses and such that you're, that you're sitting underneath because their lawyers have to review every single one of them and, and make sure they understand how you're using them. So just keep a spreadsheet. Retention, again, knowing what your plan is going forward with your employees and whether or not there's any potential litigation. Have you ever been told by anybody that there's something that you're doing that's not kosher? So summing it up, and number two is probably the most important to me. Start with your mega scale. Take a look at a really successful company. So sit down, take a look at Super Evil Megacorp, right? What do, what do their departments, their divisions, their groups look like? And then tear that down, bring it down to a micro scale. Those are the positions you have to hire for. Scaling up is very, very difficult if you don't have that grand plan. We always call it the three to five year plan. You should know what your company looks like five years from now. You should dream about what your company looks like five years from now. Spend time on your HR documents. It'd be one of the best things you ever did. I know it's really tough. You feel like you're being a jackass and you don't want to push your employees. At the same time, you got to own the work that they do. It's very, very important. Get to know your competitors. One of the hardest things that I had to learn in my 20s and 30s. Um, is sometimes it's okay to go have a beer with your competitor and just talk about your shared challenges. Um, and you might find a competitor that tells you, hey, somebody wanted to acquire us, but we're not interested right now. I'll hook you up. I've had it happen. Don't build a xenophobic board. Um, it's pretty important, right? You, you, you want to have a pretty broad, diverse board that's actually going to challenge you. Set milestones and hit them just real quick. Carmack, if everybody knows who Carmack is, John Carmack, when he founded id, id used to publish their plan files. Does anybody remember their plan files? All of the key executives at id used to publish a plan file, john.plan, and it was all the things that they were planning on doing in the next six months, and they would go through and just kind of tick stuff off of the, as, as they went. And it was like they were basically giving away what the company was gonna do. Well, the important part is they were publishing milestones to the public and they were hitting them because it's embarrassing not to hit them. All of your executives should publish their milestones for everyone to see, and they should hit them consistently or be embarrassed when they don't. And then lastly, checking your ego. When you go to negotiate, you have to realize you're dealing with someone who has never seen your company. They don't understand what things you love and what things you're willing to give up. You have to educate them, share it with them, but in a passionate way. Try not to take offense when you have those conversations. So I'm going to open up for questions. I hope I covered some 
some ground for everyone. But uh, if anyone has questions regarding how you raise money, who you go to to raise money, it's extremely difficult in the games industry, and then ultimately how you start setting your company up, up for sale and, and, and find someone to acquire your company, absolutely happy to answer those here, over email, outside, whatever, so. Thanks for the talk today. Um, did you invest in Super Evil Megacorp before or after the launch of Vainglory? Oh, way before. Yeah, at the inception of the company. Hmm. Um, we had a relationship with some of their founding members that actually goes back to, um, back to Rovio, so. Thank you. Hi, uh, great, great presentation. I would actually like to talk to you afterwards. Um, you said that uh, you've probably been advisor on, on, on boards, right? What, what do you, because you, you get a lot of offers probably, what do you really look for in a company when people ask you to come on the advisory board or be a mentor or like, you know, what, what is it that you really look for? And I, I mean, besides just the personality, I mean, what, what qualities, what, uh, what USPs uh, or, you know, um, like, uh, what is it called, like unique competences uh, do they have uh, sure. that, that you want? Uh, sure. That's actually a great question um, because I'm on uh, several boards that I regret joining. <laughs> and I, I've been thinking carefully about why, you know, why that is. Um, and I'm on, a, I'm on a handful that I absolutely love. It's the same criteria that I use when I invest my personal money uh, into, into companies. And that is, I want a CEO who wants to take over the world, right? I, I want a CEO to look at me and say, the only thing stopping me from conquering this entire industry is this little bit of money. And, and it's, it's that energy, that passion, that conviction um, that, that, that really tends to get people excited. Uh, you know, I mean, people like me, unfortunately, you know, I've been around and, and most of the people that you'll wanna recruit for your board have been around, they're a little burned out. On, on the industry. Um, and so it's not about setting huge expectations, it's a matter of projecting that energy and that excitement, that passion, um, to where you're really gonna be a joy to work with uh, in terms of your execution. That doesn't mean there won't be arguments, that doesn't mean you won't just completely disregard your board members at times. Don't ever feel obligated, you know, to, to, to follow the direction of your board members or the advice of your board members. Um, but it's going to be, a, it's going to be for reasons of passion. It's going to be a really involved relationship. So, um, again, Mark Andreessen, if you know who he is, uh, you know, one of the things I love about Mark, he and I have had some issues over the years, but I do, I love certain things about him. You know, he just banged the table and he said, you know, I want CEOs to tell me they're going to take over the blankety blank world um, and, 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 and that's the feeling that you have to, you have to project. So. Thank you very much, James. Thank you.